thrilled to be here. Um, this is not a uh, uh, sales pitch to try to get you to go into the furniture business. I could care less what business you go into. But I'm very passionate about people finding that thing, that one thing that they were made for. So I think one of the most burning questions that all of us have in life is, why am I here? You've got your whole life in front of you, right? And you only get one shot at it. And it would be a shame to waste it, even a day of it. So what I want you to think of when you're thinking about your life is, every day is adding up to what you are going to become and heading you toward a destination that you'll arrive at. What is that destination? Well, it all has a lot, it has a lot to do with perspective. And I think the most important thing that we all need to do is understand that it's not about us and we've been made for something way beyond ourselves. So why am I here is a great question and it goes to purpose. Alright? The other part of this is whose purpose? And so there's a wonderful book and if you want to read it at some point it's, it's a terrific book. It's The Me I Want to Be by John Ortberg. And it speaks to how I live in the center of God's will consistently. Point being, whose will? God's will or my will? And the, and the title could be a little bit misleading. To me, I want to be. The real question is, who is the me God wants me to be? And that's where you're going to find fulfillment. Most of the college kids that I knew when I was there and have been acquainted with are trying to figure out what can I do to make the most money, make the best living for myself. Uh, it's a reasonable question because we all want a decent living. But at the end of the day, I don't care how much money you get, that's not where you're going to find fulfillment. You're going to find fulfillment when you find your purpose. And honestly, when you find God's purpose. It's a wonderful verse, Ephesians 2.10. And it says this. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, under good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's a mouthful. Think about that. God's got a plan for your life. Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, not for evil, but for welfare, to give you a future and a hope. And if you don't know that, find that. Because to know that God has a purpose for your life, first of all, look out at this world. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that this place was designed. And it works well together because everything in it has a purpose. And we don't even begin to understand how it all works. We're, we're all about trying to figure it out. And yet, within that makeup, in that plan, you have a specific purpose. We're not here by accident. And here's a sad tale. Strength finders, you've read, you've done the strengths, right? We'll tell you that 80% of people are not using their strengths at work. So how fulfilled do you think they might be if they're not using their strengths at work? Not very. All right, so a little bit about me. When I got out of college, my uh, father gave me some great advice. He said, go to work for a good company, start at the bottom and work your way up. I'm still working on it. That was 40 years ago. I've been with the company for 40 years. And it's been the ride of a lifetime. And it's been terrific. And I wouldn't change a day of it. But it isn't about the furniture business. I'm not using my strengths because I happen to have a perfect fit for the furniture business. What it is, is I thoroughly enjoy the role that I've carved out for myself. And I've got the freedom to do it in a way that I'm able to exercise my strengths every single day. And it's extremely fulfilling. 
And here's another little secret for you. When you find the thing you're made for, you'll be so good at it that compensation won't be a problem. Does that make sense? The other thing is you'll be so good at it and it'll be so easy and you'll enjoy it so much it won't <coughs> feel like work. Who knew? Does that sound like something worth pursuing? I think so. Absolutely. So, how do we find this elusive sweet spot? Well, another thing that I do is I teach something called a master's program, and it's really designed for 50-somethings who've gotten to the place in their life where they've got everything they want, they've had per pretty much success, but it's like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life that's going to have meaning and value and, and significance? Because too often people make a lot of money and they find out, is that all there is? That's the big question. Is that all there is? It's not fulfilling. Tom Brady has asked that exact question after he won, won, won his third Super Bowl. Is that all there is to life? All the money and all the fame and everything is not fulfilling if you're not really doing what God made you to do. And you know what? At the end of the day, it's really about adding value. Everything that we do is about adding value to the universe, to life, to other people. And it's what we give that creates our legacy. That's what we leave behind. Not money, not things. So what we're looking for is you've got your purpose. We've already talked about that. And that's really God's purpose, right? Ephesians 2.10. And then you've got your potential. And that's your strengths. That's how he's made you. And then this third one is what drives the whole bus. It's passion. Can you find something in your life that you're so passionate about that you would spend your life pursuing nothing but that? It's not about money. Again, I say that. And there's another American dream that's a big lie. And if you can start out your life knowing where you're going, Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. If you know where you're going, where you're not going, it'll sure make a difference in how you get there. And guess what? Retirement's not the end of the road. It's not the golden dream. It's not what we're looking for. You know why? Because we're not made for that. We're made for purpose. We're made to fulfill our potential. And we're made to be driven by passion. Wouldn't it be great if we could figure out what that little sweet spot was right there? It is great. It's exciting. It's fulfilling. And it's thrilling. And you wake up in the morning and you think, wow, I get to do this again. How cool is that? All right, so let's talk a little bit about potential. Come on, these are my strengths. going to share with you my mission statement because we all need one. And if you want to know how to write one, just go on the internet and Google how to write a mission statement. Truly, it's there. Everything's on the internet. As you know. So, and I'll explain why I'm doing this in a minute. leaders to find and fulfill their mission or calling and live it out with passion. Well, how does that line up with my strengths? Well, inspiring is all about activating. You can, if you inspire somebody to do something, you turn them on, let them up, activate them, right? So, you're, what you're going to see is every one of the, this is derived from all of that. So, Leaders. Why leaders? Any thoughts on that? Which word do you think? 
uses that. Why would I choose leaders? Strategic. Okay, strategic. It is strategic to use leaders for sure. What do leaders have that just non-leaders don't have? Vision. Vision. What's under leaders? Learners. Learners. What else? What do you have to have if you're a leader? Followers. Followers. <laughs> right? So, when you're leading a leader, you're leading their followers as well. And that's called leverage. And leverage is all about maximizing what you have. Maximizer is somebody who can't, what isn't interested in average. We want to take something that's good and make it great. Good to great. Have you all read that book? Is that part of your curriculum? Should be. Great book. It's a fabulous book. Why? And basically the premise behind it is you get the right people on the bus and the right seats on the bus and you've got the opportunity to have a great organization. Well, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about finding out what people's potential is and putting it to use. Um, in a team where it's best serves the, the team. Does that make sense? Sure it does. So, leverage, maximizer, to find and fulfill. And that again, that's the strategic part, discovery. And so, st strategic is really about solving problems. Somebody who's strategic can take three data points out of ten and start solving the problem. The problem is, three data points isn't always enough. So you might head down a path where you've got to stop and, oops, you know, adjust. As opposed to analytical, and I didn't see anybody on the list that was analytical, but an analytical person won't even start the process until they have all 10 data points. What would be the point? Why would I start something until I have all the information? Well, that makes sense. The only problem with that is analysis paralysis. You never really know if you have all the data points. So. So you put a strategic and an analytical together and you've got dynamite. Because strategic wants to move forward, and analytical will hold them back, keep them from being impulsive. You put them together and they'll really come up with something terrific. Does that make sense? That's how the strengths work together. It just so happens my son is both. And I've never quite figured that one out, but it's quite a combination. So good for him. And he is a great problem solver. Okay, their mission. To find and fulfill their mission. So, what do you think that's about? Again, it's about maximizer. If you find somebody, you help somebody find what they're made for and light them up. Passion. What do you think is going to happen in their life? You think they're going to be activated? And their mission, really, honestly, is all about this. And the arranger is the guy who takes the puzzle pieces and puts them in the right spot. Right? So, my job is a regional manager. I've got 25 stores, 15 direct reports, and my job is to make sure that I've got the right people in those spots. And if not, do something about it. Well, I've been at this a long time, and the real joy of what I do now is that I've got the right people in the right spots. So my job is easy. Now what do I do? Now we work on this part. We work on vision. We work on what can we do to take it to the next level. How can we really maximize our opportunity here? It's fun. What happens when you get people in the wrong spot? Have you ever walked into a store and been met by a sales clerk who just wasn't all there? Wasn't there at all? Just not engaged? Not interested? Bored? What do you think that person does to that organization? As opposed to the, the lady that grabs you in the cosmetic aisle and pulls you over there and says, look, we're going to make you beautiful today. And she really gets it. And you feel beautiful when she's done with you. Which one of those two people do you think is really doing the most good for that organization? That's easy to see. If you have negative people in an organization, it's because they're not in their sweet spot. They're not operating in an area of strength. Same for you. So how did I get to be a regional manager? It really wasn't difficult. <clears throat> I started at the bottom, unloading trucks, 
in the warehouse and I made sure that I unloaded those trucks faster and quicker and better than anybody else. And then I went into the display in the store, same thing. I wanted to make sure that the store looked the most beautiful it could be. It was I artistic, not particularly, but I worked hard at it. And then the credit, oh, I hated that. I hated collecting accounts. It was awful, but I had to do it. I had to learn it, and I did, and I did it well. Whatever it is that you're called to do, do it the best that you can. Don't leave anything on the table, ever. Always shine. Always add more than what's expected of you. And if you'll give more than what's expected, I promise you, it will always come back to you. You'll always get it back. It will always come back to you. It's a process. Life is a process. So, it starts out real simple. Let's see. Yeah, well, I can say. There's three words that we're going to use. Unconscious, conscious, competent, incompetent. In any process, you start out you're unconsciously incompetent. You're clueless. You don't know what you don't know. When I went up to Birmingham to be a system manager, I was 24 years old, 23 years old. I was clueless. I've done all these jobs, but I had no idea how to manage people. I was unconsciously incompetent. Fortunately, I had a 66-year-old boss who had enough patience to or enough wisdom to recognize where I was and enough patience to, to be willing to bring me along because I was sent to him and they figured, well, I've got to make something of this guy because he doesn't know what he doesn't know. I didn't have a clue. What do you think the next prop spot might be? Think about learning when you learn to drive. You got behind the wheel and you learned to drive, right? And you didn't know what you didn't know and you felt uncomfortable, unconsciously incompetent. Then you became consciously incompetent. There's a wonderful story in the, in the Bible about this. Says, I call it my Peter Principle. What is the Peter Principle? Well, the Peter Principle, you've probably heard, is where people rise to the level of their beyond the level of their competence, where they're no longer able to perform. But that's not the Peter Principle I'm talking about. This is the Peter Principle, Jesus walking on water, Peter Principle. Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter calls out to him, Lord, call me and I'll come to you. And he says, come on. So Peter gets out of the boat, and he's walking on water until what happened? Remember? He looked down, and then what happened? Oops. He said, I can't do this. I can't walk it. He was consciously incompetent. He knew he couldn't do it. I can't walk on water. Okay? That's consciously incompetent. And then, through practice, through process, through experience, you become consciously competent. And you can say, I got this. I can do this. Right? Golfer, I'm a golfer. So, and, and it's anything. Anything that you choose to do. I also play the piano. So, practice gets you to the place where you don't have to think about it. <coughs> but it, you, it, it's constant. It, you have to stay at it. And so, when you've practiced enough, then you can do it and it's automatic. But until you get there, you, you know, there's 47 moving parts on your body or however many there are. And there's 47 things that can go wrong. And so when you're playing poorly, you're trying to figure out which of the 47 is going wrong. And then when you figure it out, you start concentrating on it. So then you're in that consciously competent stage when you figure it out, but then you're thinking about your swing, and that's not where you want to be. You want to be unconsciously competent. To where you are so well practiced, and you're in the zone, and you're doing it, and it's all working, and it's fun, and it's easy, and there's nothing to think about, because you just you know, let your muscles do the work. You're unconsciously competent. So you almost be golfers. Are you any good? We hope. But you get it. I mean, you understand what that process was all about. Well, life is just like that. Life is just like that. So, you're going to get out of school. You're going to go get your law degree or your doctor degree or whatever degree. And you're going to instantly say, I'm ready. Give me my $150,000 a year and let me get on with life. Not so much. 
temper your expectations because no matter how much education you have until you have experience to go along with it, you're still not worth very much. And that's okay. It's okay because as you, as you really do work through these processes and you allow yourself to grow and gain experience, not only is it gratifying and fulfilling, but you feel a sense of satisfaction in having learned something that is worth something. And as you go through the process along, along the way, all of a sudden, you get a sense of who you are. All right, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about some of your strengths. And I'm not sure if they came from this class or not. But, um, and we're going to do this at another level the next time I come back. Um, because I think there's just a whole lot to this and it's really good stuff. One thing I want you to think about and take your strengths, first of all, don't just put it in a drawer and forget about it. This is a very valuable tool that will help you along the way. The other thing I would highly recommend you do is start working on your mission statement. And for what it's worth, I'm pretty good at this. I could write a mission statement based on the strengths that I see on the page for each of you. But it wouldn't be your mission statement. And it took me at least a hundred iterations of my own to get all the words right. And you won't have it until it resonates with you. But once it resonates with you, it's a guide. It's a wonderful guide. So now when I walk in to work and I know what my mission is, my job is to inspire people. Do you do that every day? You can. So when I visit stores, which I do every week, my job is to leave something behind that they didn't have before I got there. Something that will spur them on to do their job a little better than they did it before. Something that will help them catch a vision for what we're trying to do. It's not self furniture we're really in the dream fulfillment business. We want people to have beautiful spaces to take their breath away when they walk into their room. That's what we're really trying to do. Well, that sounds a whole lot better than selling furniture, doesn't it? Uh, okay. The strengths do not define roles. But within a given role, the strengths explain how they'll be done. So here's a good one. Communication. Woo. Includer. Positivity. Individualization. So, communication, obviously, that's the ability to partake information with, with other people. Communicate. Woo is win others over. It's somebody who walks into the room and works the room and makes sure they've engaged with everybody. We've seen those people that are definitely extroverts. Includer is no one left behind. Everybody's on the team and everybody's important. Positivity speaks for itself. Individualization is looking in the eye of each individual, we're really trying to discover and define each person and how they fit into the team. So, I want you to think of how does that fit Bill Clinton? Boy, is he a good communicator? He bet he is. He has got so much woo that when he walks into the room, it's kind of like the light came on. And he just draws everybody to him like a magnet. He's amazing, truly. He's an includer. Absolutely makes everybody feel important, like they're part of the team. It's all positive. It's all good. Individualization, and he makes you feel like you're the only person that matters. Hmm. Pretty cool. So this person could be a politician and be very successful at it. But does it mean that they have to be a politician? No, not at all. What about sales? And by the way, for those of you who think sales is not what you want to do, trust me, if that's what you're made to do, that's where you should be. Because sales is what makes the world go around. And the people that are good at it are very well compensated, but they're also providing a terrific service. 
Because sales is all about making the right connections. It's not about getting people to do something they don't want to do. That's what people think sales is. Try to get you to buy something that you don't need and you don't want because I need to make money. That's not sales. Sales is making connections between needs and wants and doing it well. So, sales. The ability to win somebody over is simply to get them into your confidence and get them to trust you. Communication, same thing, is being able to communicate with a person comfortably and in a way that engages them. Includer includes the person in the process. So if somebody in sales here would make sure they understand what the real needs are. What is it that's, that, why are you here? What is it that you want? How can I help? Includer, positivity, and we can do this. We can figure this out. We've got a solution for you and you're going to love it. Individualization is making sure that the, 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 the answer to the problem, the solution to the issue is specific and it's appropriate, right? So this person could be terrific in sales. Now, could this person be a CEO? Sure. My, my point is trying to figure out where a role might be isn't as important as in a role. How would a person use these strengths? Does that make sense? So it's not limiting. However, there are roles that better fit specific strengths. Okay, let's do another one. Restorative, relator, empathy, adaptable, and developer. Restorative is all about solving problems. My, my wife is restorative. And it's uncanny. I mean, it just is. If you've got an issue or a need or a problem, she knows what the answer is. She just knows how to help you with it. If you are looking for pillows that are on sale, even though she's not in the market for pillows, her brain works so that she captures all the information for all the ads for everything that's on sale all the time. She can tell you what store pills are on, are on sale and what the price is. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't even know who sells pills. Right? Difference. Relator. <clears throat> As opposed to woo. So, woo, think in terms of an inch deep and a mile wide. A relator is exactly the opposite. Not very wide, but deep. So a relator is more likely to have five, four or five very close friends, somebody that they really connect with, but doesn't really enjoy going to a party with a bunch of people that you're not talking to on any kind of a meaningful level. That's me. I can't stand that. I'm not a cocktail party person. I'd rather sit down and talk to somebody about something that's meaningful and lasting than I had just to get to shoot the, shoot the breeze. Neither one of them is right or wrong, by the way. None of these strengths are right or wrong. They just are. They are what they are. So understanding what yours are and how they work is very valuable. Empathy. <clears throat> Empathy is that person who has just the ability to connect with people and where they are and how they feel. It's extremely important and valuable in particular roles. Adaptable means that you're able to adjust and adapt to the needs of different people. And then developer is somebody who wants to bring folks along. Think of a role that might fit. Would that be something that would be good for a pastor? A teacher? But a youth leader? Right? See how that fits? It's pretty cool, isn't it? What I'd like to do the next time is I'd like to share with you some broader roles and then how these strengths fit into those roles. Um, because having a sense of where we need to go based on our strengths would save us a lot of time and a lot of trouble. 
If I knew what my strengths were, would I have done anything differently? Not really. I always knew intuitively that there was a leader there somewhere wanting to come out. And so I've always gravitated toward that. And I think most of us probably do those kinds of things. But what I don't want for any of you is I don't want any of you to get stuck in something just because it's where you find yourself and you're not able to use the strengths and the abilities that God has given you the major. Questions? Any thoughts? Any? What do you got? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? 